cryogenically derived mercury is a ubiquitous contaminant where global and regional sources are primarily linked to mining activities and coal combustion, but um, atmospheric emissions that are deposited onto the landscape through rain and snow really constitute the largest source of um, anthropogenic mercury. So following deposition, um, a significant fraction of mercury is transported through the landscape and into aquatic systems where they can accumulate through time. But once in these aquatic systems, bacteria convert mercury to methylmercury, which is a more toxic form of mercury that can bioaccumulate and biomagnify through food webs. And then it's really that last leg of the mercury cycle that, or I guess where a large proportion of health concerns arise. So human and wildlife exposure to mercury occurs when fish that have accumulated methylmercury are consumed, which results in fish and more commonly now uh, wildlife tissue consumption, consumption advisories and guidelines. So as such, to protect human health, state agencies routinely monitor mercury concentrations and commonly consumed fish and issue recommendations and update guidance concerning consumption. Um, atmospheric deposition is particularly high in the Northeast, and I guess particularly in Southern New England, and prominent land cover characteristics really facilitate the transformation of mercury to methylmercury and its delivery to aquatic food webs. But during the 70s to the mid 90s, uh, stricter mercury emission regulations reduced atmospheric deposition of mercury to the landscape across the whole Northeast. and we see that mercury deposition has really declined markedly in the Northeast since then. So in this uh, figure here, we see that the darker blue squares represent areas where mercury deposition has declined the most over the past few decades. So I guess combined, we can really see that the Northeast has a rather dynamic history of mercury deposition. And I guess that history can kind of provide headaches from a public and wildlife health perspective. So we know that mercury in fish tissue is correlated with atmospheric deposition of mercury. And it is logical to expect that mercury in fish will decline as mercury emissions decline, but this may not always be the case. So this conceptual figure here shows that at first, atmospherically deposited mercury increases mercury concentrations in fish tissue, but as emissions are reduced and within like biogeochemical and ecological processes, the core become more influential, we see that fish mercury concentrations are expected to decline, but the, the long-term patterns of mercury decline will vary in the rate of decline and the magnitude. So I guess in a nutshell, we can expect mercury and fish to decline through time, but the rate of response across systems is uncertain. So with this in mind, our study goal is to evaluate temporal trends in mercury concentrations in largemouth bass. So largemouth bass compose one of the most widespread fish throughout the Northeast, and they're primarily piscivorous as adults, and we can therefore expect baseline mercury con concentrations to be high. Um, we would further expect their mercury concentrations to loosely track with mercury deposition but how quickly mercury has declined after emission regulations really, if at all, kind of remains unknown at this point, making it difficult to understand current and hu current human and wildlife consumption risks. So with that, our specific objectives are to evaluate temporal changes in bass mercury concentrations large or after um, emission regulations were largely enacted. And we also want to estimate the year when bass mercury concentrations are less than 0.5 micrograms per gram. And this represents the EPA consumption criterion for safe consumption. Um, and I would also like to mention, or I guess recognize that that 0.5 micrograms per gram cutoff isn't necessarily federal law, but it's rather considered a common indicator value and is a level with which there's enough risk to be conserved. A concern. So we'll use that for a cutoff for this uh, analysis. To address our objectives, we sampled bass tissue concentrations from 23 lakes across Connecticut during 1995, 2005 to 2006, and 2019 to 2020. 
Our sampling scheme across Connecticut really allowed us to repeatedly sample the same handful of lakes across a, a nearly 25 year period and really across a relatively small spatial scale. So that really affords us the chance to evaluate temporal trends in mercury concentrations while avoiding differences in uh, either large scale climactic processes and spatial and elevational influences on uh, mercury depositional patterns across the landscape. And across these 23 lakes, we primarily collected bass by boat electrofishing and through anglers at bash, uh, bass fishing tournaments as well. In each lake, we targeted uh, 10 to 15 largemouth bass, taking samples from fish across the size spectrum. So during 1995 and 2005 to 6, um, at least 10 bass were collected from each lake, where we took a minimum of three fish per length group listed. Um, and we changed things up a little bit during 2019 to 2020, where we collected 10 to 15 bass per lake, where we targeted a maximum of two fish per 25 millimeter length group or inch length group. And we targeted fish um, greater than 254 millimeters, so 10 inches. So we expanded uh, the sizes at which we were taking, uh, sizes of fish that we were taking samples from. And across all uh, sampling periods, we sampled lakes between no May and November. Once the bass were collected, or once we collected bass, we measured all fish for total length and removed tissue for mercury analysis. And the tissue removal procedures are slightly different across time, and I'm briefly going to walk through them here. During 1995, all largemouth bass were sacrificed for whole fillet axial tissue removal from just the left dorsal musculature. And, and during 2005 and 2006, uh, similar procedures were used, but in addition to whole tissue samples, uh, non-lethal biopsy punches were used to collect tissue samples from a subset of fish uh, to address agency interest in non-lethal sampling of fish tissues. And from these collections, uh, we found that biopsy mercury concentrations were similar to whole fillet concentrations, which suggests that non-lethal biopsy punches are a viable method of evaluating mercury concentrations in fish. And based on these results, during 2019 to 2020, we primarily collected biopsy tissue samples from the left dorsal musculature of each bass. And each bass was therefore released alive after the wound was uh, covered with vet bond. After collection, all tissue samples were sent to the Yukon Center for Environmental Sciences and Engineering for, the merc or for mercury analysis. Their mercury concentrations were determined by cold vapor atomic absorption spectrometry, and their standard quality assurance procedures were employed during uh, tissue processing. And um, I could talk afterwards or email me, if, email me if folks are interested in further lab details. But in all, uh, all tissue mercury concentrations are reported Nine minutes. total wet weight concentration in micrograms per gram. In terms of the analysis, uh, we first standardized all fish mercury concentrations. Um, so an issue with data like these are the, is really the confounding effect of length. So we chose to standardize mercury concentrations to those of a 355 millimeter total length bass, and we chose that length for two reasons. One, this is the statewide minimum length for consumption, and two, this length was well within the range of bass lengths collected throughout this study, and we therefore avoided extrapolating um, values towards the end of a regression where variability is likely highest. To estimate these standard values, we constructed a linear regression model of uh, mercury concentration as a function of mass total length for each period in each lake. And we log transform both values prior to the analysis just to meet uh, model assumptions. Then, using these standard values, we used the repeated measures ANOVA to evaluate differences in mercury concentrations across the sampling period. We also used a post hoc two keys test to distinguish significant differences in time periods. And for our second objective, we used a linear regression to predict the year when a vast majority of bass uh, 
have mercury concentrations that would be less than the EPA safe consumption criterion of 0.5. We assume that using a prediction function, function excuse me, to determine when the upper prediction interval and not the mean value would cross this EPA consumption criterion would, pro would provide a conservative estimate of when mass consumption is largely safe, given that extrapolating values outside of your data range can sometimes induce some undesired variability. And with that, uh, all analyses were conducted with an alpha 0 0.05. Moving on to the results, uh, we were un unable to sample three of the lakes during the most recent assessment due to low, uh, low water levels, uh, but we hope to sample them this upcoming spring. So in all, we captured a fairly similar size structure of bass through time and caught similar numbers of fish. Uh, however, we relied heavily on bass tournaments during the first two assessments and used primarily boat electrofishing during the most recent assessment uh, due to COVID restrictions. So we tended to catch a few, mo a few more smaller bass than uh, the two previous assessments. But I think the take home point from here is that we did a pretty good job not deviating from our fish sampling scheme that I outlined earlier. Looking at mercury trends through time, we found that the mean concentration of a standard largemouth bass has only recent, recently declined uh, through time across Connecticut lakes. The red line here represents the that EPA consumption criterion I keep mentioning. Of course, it's log transformed here. But we see that contemporary mean bass mercury concentrations still exceed the consumption criterion in some lakes. So knowing that within lake processes and other processes can cause variable trends in mercury concentrations across lakes, uh, I just investigated the trends by individual lakes using some of our ANOVA outputs. So the figure, show, the figure here shows mercury concentrations on the Y and year on the X. And according to our ANOVA output, we found that there were 11 lakes that had declining trends in mercury concentrations uh, that were pretty marketable and, marketable and um, consistently declined. There were 10 lakes where uh, mercury concentra concentrations showed uh, little change through time or there was no clear trend. And finally, there were two lakes that showed an increase in mercury concentrations through time. So revisiting this plot from earlier. Four um, minutes, 30 seconds, Chris. OK. We used prediction intervals created from a linear regression. Um, we were able to predict that the upper prediction interval for largemouth bass mercury concentrations would cross that EPA consumption criterion during the year 2093. So in all, it's going to take around another 70 years for a majority of bass in Connecticut lakes to have tissue mercury concentrations that are deemed safe to eat. So in all, uh, we documented that bass mercury concentrations have declined since the mid-90s, and trends varied across lakes due to either within lake processes or other processes not measured here. We also found that some lakes still have fish with high mercury concentrations, and it's going to take several decades for bass population uh, mercury concentrations to be largely under that EPA consumption criterion. And in, really, in a nutshell, mercury contamination is going to be a concern for a long time here in Connecticut. We know that bass are a highly sought after sport fish, and they are even on the most recent cover of the Connecticut Fishing Guide. And, but bass harvest in Connecticut waters is currently less than 10% due to the popularity of catch and release fishing. So this knowledge combined with our results should be encouraging from both an ecological and public health perspective. However, um, human population abundance and socioeconomic class and demographics are spatially structured throughout Connecticut. And Connecticut is culturally diverse in some, albeit small, areas that tend to be densely populated. Further, there's also some observational data that suggests that bass harvest is not equal across 
all economic classes and demographics, and it's seemingly likely higher in minority or non-Western cultural communities. So combining our results with this knowledge, it, I mean, it's fairly logical that, I mean, just mercury exposure risk is not the same for everyone. And at a thousand foot view, bass are really the sentinel species that we monitor as an indicator of mercury consumption risks. And there's plenty of other freshwater species out there that are consumed probably more regularly by anglers. We know that harvested fish provide important cultural and recreational services and contribute to individual and societal well-being and can serve as a major food dish for some families. And we're now understanding that many of these benefits and potential exposure uh, disproportionately affect certain segments of our community. And in Connecticut, uh, the State Department of Public Health provides fish consumption advisories in six different languages and posts these advisories online and at access points of popular fisheries to try and educate anglers on the potential risks of consumption. And in all, we really assert that marrying the mercury contamination patterns found in our study with social ecological conditions is likely going to be important for future risk assessments and consumption guidance and particularly when addressing issues of potential environmental justice. So with that, I would like to thank our funding source of the EPA and then the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. I would like to thank um, the folks that assisted with data collection. Um, I'd like to thank Megan Lally, Mike Bushine, Ed Machowski, and Chris McDowell from CTDEP and their help facilitating this process. And I'd like to thank UConn CIS uh, employees for processing our tissue samples. And with that, I'll take any questions. Great talk.